What is up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Rani Asani Show. Today's guest is Mark Lazarus, Director of Lazarus Legal, and formerly the Legal Director for world-renowned energy drink brand Monster Energy, where he was the co-head of the European Legal Department. Mark is a lawyer and a former barrister who has extensive experience working with startups, FMCG businesses, and tech companies, amongst many other industries and sectors, on a variety of commercial law areas, including intellectual property, litigation, and dispute resolution. In this episode, we discuss a variety of topics on how businesses and startups can grow whilst avoiding any legal traps or landmines. What is up, everyone? This is Ronnie, your host of the Ronnie Asani Show. My number one goal in this show is to bring you some of the most amazing and accomplished individuals in the business world to share with you some real, raw, and authentic business insights. We sit down and talk in a casual setting, nothing too serious, yet we unpack some of the most incredible ideas, concepts, and best practices. So please, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Oh, and don't forget to share the love. Like, share, and subscribe. Gracias, amigos. We are live. Another episode with the one and only Mark Lazarus, the uh, person I personally look up to when it comes to uh, a few things. You do and look up to me because... Prim- yeah, because I'm a couple of inches shorter. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, as well as in the area of law, more precisely as well, commercial law, because you've been doing that for, God knows, last 50 years. I'm uh, making you... Uh, three look very ma- three months now? <laughs> 15 years? Mm. 10 years, 15? I started practicing law in 2004. 16 years? Cool. Wow, that, that's a long time. Makes mm. me feel really old. Do you feel old? Do it, mm, I do. When, when like I'm running yeah. and my knees give in. Yeah. You know, but I still, I, I, I still feel like I'm, I should be like 24. I'm like, where's the time gone? Mm. You know? I guess I guess sometimes you just don't think about it, and one day you wake up, you're like, "Oh wow!" I'm like, "Whoa!" Like, damn. I'm yeah. in my forties now. I can still remember when I was 22. So when I start playing like Eminem, and like my kids are like, "Who's that?" It's like, "Oh my god, what's going on here?" Can you relate to your kids about the games they used to play when you were a kid? Can you like? Would they even be interested to know about it? Like, like I don't know what games, games that don't involve devices. Yeah, I guess, I don't know, well, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, re- I used to use the Sega Mega Drive. I, I remember so clearly the, mm. um, it was FIFA 9, uh, not FIFA, it was um, uh, the Olympics, mm. um, Barcelona 94 or something. I remember playing on the Mega Drive, um, the controller, and, and like to, to run and do the hurdles, it was like A, B, A, B, A, B, and so your fingers had to be really quick at pushing A, B, A, B, A, B to get across. Wow. And it was like, that's all you had to work out. Nowadays, you get FIFA, and it's like, I, I, on the, on the, we got the Nintendo Switch, and like these days, I, I just give up. Like, I, it's so complicated mm. to actually learn how to play the game that um, I just leave it to them. Fortnite, everything yeah. else. But yeah, on your question, mm. it, it actually brings me to an interesting topic because I was actually having a discussion the other day. I know we, we're digressing from law, but very quickly, I was actually having a discussion the other day with my wife about how, you know, the perception of where life has taken us and like safety has changed so much because as a kid, as a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old kid, and I was play, I was playing backyard cricket mm. and, and football or soccer you know, down the street in my back, or in my front yard, you know, with, with, with my neighborhood friends um, from all hours of the, of the day. I mean, especially during school holidays from the mm. mornings till late in the, into the evening, you know, I'd be gone for hours and hours on end. No one would even worry. And mm. these days it's like, you know, your kids are so used to playing on devices and being inside and not that I encourage that. I encourage going outside, but like, you know, how, how inclined are we to let our kids Go, especially if you've got like I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old to go, you know, ride their bikes mm. around the street by themselves. So, but yeah, it's a. Uh, I mean, every every generation is completely different, mm. and I think one of the things that uh, bother. I'm not a parent, so I don't have kids. But when I look at parents, some of them tend to be bothered by how things different. 
you know, for their kids versus them. And it's about understanding, okay, well, if I was that human coming up in this sort of world with, you know, from tech to, you know, changes in society and all that stuff, I would have probably been acting and living this life that way, you know? Um, I, I think as much as you can, uh, encouraging your kids to uh, interact, no matter what happens, no matter how technology evolves, human interaction is always going to be uh, super, super important. Um, so trying to find that balance is is very critical um, or imperative, like you like to say. Um, but yeah, anyway, let's jump into the law. Yep. You, so a lot of people, uh, by virtue of, you know, you having worked with a lot of businesses, startups, um, many different verticals, from tech to FMCG, uh, you worked with companies in, in real estate, um, you name it, you've been there. Um, what is quickly the story of Mark Lazarus and Lazarus Legal? Mark Lazarus has been, you know, as I said, been practicing as a lawyer for years, you know, from working private practice to working internationally to working in media entertainment firms across the UK, um, where we had some very big clients, very well-renowned clients, to working in-house and to working uh, as a barrister as well. As well, So I've done a lot of lit litigation work uh, throughout my time. But... Um, Lazarus Legal is a firm that's been around, started by my father several years ago. I started working in Lazarus Legal. It had a different name back then mm. uh, when I first came out of uni to get some experience. Um, but then... So not several years. Are you, we're talking about decades, right? De well, <clears throat> well decades. Well, I mean... Yeah. I, like 30 I mean, years or something? Well, I mean, my old man Barry's been mm. practicing as a lawyer for you know, in a, well, well in excess of 30 years. Okay. Um, so he's built a solid practice... Yep. Um, over those years and um, I started out working with him under his guidance mm. and uh, I guess out of default when I met my wife and traveled to the UK I I left and had to go and find my own feet and that's when I went into a media entertainment mm. law firm in corporate commercial um, and 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 did a lot of IP work um, and then uh, through those experiences, I then moved on. I went and, and studied to become a barrister and actually returned to Australia and spent three, three and a half years at the bar. Um, but in between, there was a, a stint where I worked at, at Monster mm. prior to going to the bar and I did six months of that. And that kind of whet the appetite for in-house and for the way uh, big multinationals, um, I mean, obviously Monster's a fast-moving consumer good brand, uh, but the way big ma uh, big na uh, multinationals operate, you know, different departments, you know, different uh, uh, tiers of, of mm. reporting, you know, di big teams, you know, everybody wanting different things at different times, your your use of time and, 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 you, and you know, how you're going to deal with so many different issues um, in, in a day. Whereas, you know, working in a smaller practice or even in a, in a bigger practice, but in a particular group is very specialized and confined to one area. Mm -hmm. So um, working at Monster, you know, gave me that, that taste. And then I passed the bar exams and moved back to Australia in uh, 2010 uh, mm -hmm. to become a barrister. And I did that for three and a half years. Um, and for it, people out there that love the law and are passionate about the law and about, about you know, interpretation of law and case law and judgments and, uh, and, and, and constructing arguments um, that will potentially look to benefit their clients and, and change the way, you know, we, we operate in society, you know, legally, mm -hmm. um, then, then b being a barrister is, is something that I would encourage. Um, for me, I absolutely hated it. You know, reading 85-page judgments um, and then interpreta interpreting a specific area of law and how it would be perceived and then arguing that particular area in front of a judge for the, in the best interest of your client um, just wasn't what I was passionate mm. about. Mm. Having done six months stint at Monster prior to going to the bar, I, I got that taste and that flavor for interacting with, with clients uh, on their level. Um, not not on a, a barrister 
kind of operates on a different level because they have the relationship really with the lawyers um, and they're taking briefs from the lawyers to act in the best interests of the mm. client, but also to the court. Whereas a, a lawyer is dealing directly with the client day mm. in, day out, and really needs to understand uh, the way that client's business operates. Mm. Whereas a barrister needs to understand kind of more high level and, and needs to understand how that the client's particular issue, because most of the time when you go to a barrister, it's, it's because of, uh, of a litigation or a dispute, yep. um, how that's going to, they dissect what the issue and what the problem is and how it can be legally argued to, to achieve the best and desired result for the client. Whereas as a lawyer, um, yes, you've got litigation and disputes, but you're also dealing with day-to-day you know, affairs of the mm. of, of the client in terms of how they protecting themselves legally for the long term. Um, and that can be anything, you know, from, you know, raising money to just to safeguarding their business, to protecting their IP, to, to doing business deals and structures and, and, and joint ventures. And, and that's, that's what's exciting to me. What are the top three things um, you think a startup or a business that is still in its early stages, maybe the first five years or so, that you think are super critical from a commercial law or law in general uh, standpoint? What I, Like if I'm starting a business, let's say I'm starting a, a SaaS, a software as a service um, in the software development tech space, and let's say to give it a more concrete concrete example, uh, it's a marketing technology or a marketing tool, right? Um, and you know, I got all these ambitious ideas. I'm developing the product, etc. Uh, but I'm really starting from the scratch. What are the main three things you think I need to be aware of and work on from a commercial law standpoint? Well, I'll try. I'll try keep it to three. But yep. but I get asked this question indirectly every every day because mm-hmm. I'm dealing with uh, one man band startups all the way up to very experienced and established businesses. Mm-hmm. And um, if we break it, break a startup down to a business that is starting up, you know, then a lot of the time and the biggest hurdle that lawyers face and startup lawyers face as well is trying to to convey to the client why um, legal advice and service is so important at the early stage of their business because there are so many other things that this startup is looking to spend their money on if they have to spend money because a lot of the time they're bootstrapping the business so you know every dollar every cent is 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 worth something you know you've yeah. got you know, you come into your industry, you know, you've got your marketing and your Google AdWords and, you know, a week of Google AdWords could be the cost of putting together an NDA, you know, for a few hours or whatever it may be. But I guess the, the, it really depends what type of, your, of business you are in and mm. at what stage you are of your business. Yep. So the, the key things in my view, I guess the first thing is to structure the, the business correctly. So if you are going to build that business, um, to be more than just yourself, mm-hmm. then you need to have the right structure in place. If, you, if you're just trading as a sole trader, um, then you potentially are, you, you, you're personally liable for whatever goes wrong in the business and your assets are at stake because it's, you're, 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 it's, it's you and you only. And if things go sour or go south, then um, a creditor or party can come after you and sue you and then, and then your assets are on the line. So... Um, you know, getting the right structure in place, i.e. setting up a company or having a corporate entity, you can hide behind the corporate veil. And as long as you're doing everything by the book, you know, which is in accordance with the requirements under the Corporations Act, which I won't bore you with at this point. Oh, please um, feel free. You know, but, you know, acting in the best interests of, yep. of, of, the, of, of the company and, and, and complying with your fiduciary obligations under yep. the court and not trading insolvently. These are just some of the things. Then, you know... That company, any any creditor or party can only come after the company mm. and not the uh, and not the director of that mm. company. So um, you protect. There's a there's a there's a layer of protection, and then yeah. you can actually have even additional layers. So say you want to then have a 
um, a, a kind of a range of different services that are provided and you start to build up the intellectual property, you may want to have a holding entity mm. that holds that IP and then licenses that IP to a trading entity or a management services entity that then runs um, that, that runs the enterprise, runs the business. And then that, that, that entity will then enter into contracts with, you know, suppliers, manufacturers, distribu distributors, you know, yeah. landlords or, or you, know, uh, you know, when it comes to leasing. So that, that the, the, the holding company, the parent company that holds the IP is kind of carved out or, or, or separated from, um, from the, 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 management, the management entity. So number one is, is, is getting your corporate structure right, you know, and that also in, entwined with that or intertwined with that is, you know, having a shareholders agreement in place if you are a corporate entity um, and you, there's more than one director, you know, or more than, you know, more than one sole director and sole shareholder. You know, if you have multiple share, shareholders of the business, you've got co-founders, um, having a shareholders, and we discussed shareholders agreements mm. before, but yep. having a shareholders agreement that basically governs the way the business operates and runs and what happens with the shares. And, you know, there's, mm. there's all kinds of different provisions in shareholders agreements. We could talk for an hour just on the mm. provisions, but having that in place is, is, is really important. Mm. And it's not only important, for two co-founders to understand, you know, what their mm. contributions are and what their shareholding is, but it's also important if 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 an investor is going to come in to mm. the to the mix mm. at some point in time, they want to know that the business is being run and conducted properly mm. um, and have and has the right legal documents in place. Mm. So, corporate structure is is the first one. Mm. Um, I'm not. I'm doing all the talking here. Do you want me to? So, no, keep going. So, so we got the, the first one out of the way. Yeah, the first one is the structure. Is a structure. The, yep. the second one is um, is your IP, mm -hmm. you know, and, and IP can be anything from your trademarks to patents to design rights to, but, you know, to, uh, you know, you have, you have a copyright in, in works that you, you produce or create. But let's just focus on trademarks for now. So trademarks... Um, are an interesting one because there's so many different ways you can trademark, you know, a logo, a name, a color. But most of the time, uh, parties look to trademark uh, a name or a logo, you know, or an image for their business. And um, the reason you, 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 I mean, firstly, you can build a lot of IP uh, mm -hmm. in, in a mark, uh, just like Nike's done, et cetera. And, and many top uh, um, businesses have, have, uh, built reputations, et cetera, on, on the back of names and logos and slogans. Um, but having, having IP protection, having a trademark um, is absolutely imperative if, uh, <laughs> love that word, love if, that. Uh, if, um, if, uh, if you want to protect your business uh, uh, from any potential infringement in the future. So you can register trademarks in various classes. There's 45 classes of goods and services. Mm. Um, and you can protect your your particular business in certain classes, but there's obviously a cost involved, not only legal costs, but also uh, IP Australia and third party costs. And then mm. once you once you establish you know that that mark in in your in your base country, you can then look to apply for trademark. Oh, well, you don't have to do it just in your base, but you can look to apply for trademarks internationally. Um, I've got a client at the moment that has set up quite a successful business and. Actually, while I was on my way here, um, I got the instruction to um, look at doing a whole range of international trademarks for this client. Um, and you can do that. There's many different ways you can do that. And one of them is called uh, through something called the Madrid Protocol, which allows you to basically do any member countries of that protocol uh, that are signed up. You can apply through one application uh, through IP Australia uh, for trademarks in multiple countries. So again, is that typically around Europe or? Uh, well, it's Europe, the US, it's China, it's it's, it's all okay. over the place. There's okay. there's a selection, or you can go direct to each uh, country and and apply there, which, which is, is a pain in the ass. Uh, yeah, it is, but it's also it also gives you more control mm. because obviously, if you do the Madrid Protocol, there's one application, and if you get rejected in 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 uh, in the UK. Uh, or the US, then it kind of holds up the entire application while you're trying to resolve that particular issue. So, um, but it can be very, very costly as well, particularly from the, the third party fees as you start to uh, register or apply to register in so many different countries. But, you know, getting, getting your trademarks and IP, I mean, Monster spends 
millions of dollars on a, a year on its 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 international trademark mm. portfolio and monitoring it you know uh, protecting it you know when you've got to register just for any listeners out there mm. uh, who've seen any kind of products um in the market you'll you'll often notice that a product will have a tm symbol at the end trademark. Um, or an r symbol have you ever wondered what the difference is between the two uh I, I, I certainly do not know. I know what they stand for. Okay. Trademark and copyright, I think. T, T, M, and R. R is registered. Registered. Okay. <laughs> but that's all right. So, yeah, the, t, the TM stands for trademark and the R with the circle means registered trademark, basically. Yep. So, the TM is, is what you call an unregistered mark. So, you come up with a name for a product um, and you decide, um, I am going to shout out to the world that this is, I am trademarking this name as my name, no one else is to use it. Um, that's, you can, you can go and put TM on that, on the, on that name or logo, whatever it is right away. Um, but you don't have protection under the trademark act. So, you know, while you're looking to get it registered, you can put the TM symbol on there. Once you go through the application process of registering a trademark, which can take seven and a half, well, in Australia, it takes seven and a half months with objection, um, periods, etc. Once you get that certificate of registration, then you have protection under the Trademarks Act, and that trademark is registered for a period of ten years. No one, uh, uh, no one can use it in 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 the classes of goods and services in which you've registered. And if they do try to try to use it, you issue them with a very, uh, you know, very harsh cease and desist letter, um, and you've got the backing of 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 legislation of the of the Trademarks Act. So um, that's the difference. Trademarks number two, you know, or IP, I should, I should put it in a, in a whole bracket itself because there's, 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 there's patents and, and other, other trademark and uh, not trademark uh, um, intellectual property rights that, that you can protect. Um, but yeah, getting trademarks done, it's not overly expensive. Um, and if you have got, come up with an amazing name or logo for your brand, then it's, it's something that, really should consider at the early stages. So that's number two. Yep. Okay. Keep going. We we, we want to go through the top three and then we'll, we'll, we'll dive into a few other N topics. No, um, but yeah, go for it. No, number three is, I mean, it really comes, again, comes down to your business. But number three is having the right, having agreements in place that mirror or match what you're trying to achieve. So, you know, if you're a services business, if you're providing a service to a client, yeah. then having a services agreement in place that details, you know, the terms and conditions upon or the obligations of each party, mm. you know, your payment obligations, the term, mm. you know, how you get paid, when you get paid, what services you're providing, what, ser what services they, they pay providing in return, you know, it, that kind of agreement, again, also deals with intellectual property rights. It mm. deals with who owns the IP. So say, I mean, I work with a lot of FMCG brands and for any listeners out there that don't know, FMCG stands for fast moving consumer goods. So like Monster, you know, is, is, is a drinks product product, you know, beauty brands, anything that kind of, you know, at a lower cost that flies off the shelf quickly is FMCG. So, um, you know, with, with, with these types of, of, of products, you know, if you're offering, if you, if you, if you are basically offering a service or a product, um, and it may be to create a particular product like an FMCG product where you've got formulations and or recipes or anything like that, then you also want to protect your, the, the, the IP. Mm -hmm. So you may, you may have a contract manufacturer or a supplier or a, you know, a distributor of your products that you're, you're creating. So, you, so, you know, you, I guess you may have a manufacturer that's going to create a particular unique formula for a product and, who owns that formula? Who owns that recipe? You know, is it is it the is it the manuf? Because you're paying them mm. for the product, and they may turn around and say, okay, well, you know, we'll give it we'll give it to you, but we want to retain ownership of that formulation, mm. um, which may not work for you because you know then you know they can go and use that formula for any other customer or client and doesn't become unique uh, 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 to your business. So you know, having an agreement in place that kind of really sets the tone for um, you know what what the expectations are of the parties is is really important and that could be as I said a manufacturing agreement or a distribution agreement you know you know what's being distributed you know what are the volumes what are the quantities you know what are the requirements what happens if the if the targets are not met 
Um, you know, all of all, I mean, we have, you know, severance payment provisions, there's mm. all different sorts of things you can have in these agreements. And a lot of the time, you know, if you're a photographer or a videographer, or you're providing a service, um, you may not, you may just have a, a, a an invoice, you know, that will, or a quote that will then set out your terms and then you send an invoice out and there's nothing really binding as to what happens if it hasn't been fulfilled, that service or whatever. And then, and then how do you enforce it? So having the right agreements in place um, is really important um, and something that you should have. You know, if you, uh, and I'm talking a lot, but if you, if you have an app developer, for instance, that's going to build your app, you know, you should have an agreement in place with that developer as to the service that, that they're providing, the KPIs, you know, the, 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 the milestones, when, you know, when they're going to get paid their first tranche and w- what they're going to provide you in return for that first tranche. Mm. So, yeah, number three, working out what your business is and working out what kind of agreement or, or you know you need or something in writing it doesn't have to be 35 pages either but just sets out the the, the key terms upon which you know both parties are going to operate cool awesome uh so you work with a lot of fmcg businesses you've worked for large brands like um, monster you you currently work with some fmcg brands as well i do um so for anyone listening who is in that space uh can we talk a little bit specifically about fmcg what are the kind of things people need to be aware of whether these are things that um came up through uh recent changes in the regulations whether these are things that you know you just normally have to know uh because they are relevant and contextual to the fmcg space um whether it's labeling whether it's you know whatever the case may be um if it's food and beverage that's obviously you know very different than if you're uh, in the beauty um perhaps not very different but there might be certain things that are um very specific to the food and beverage um so i guess the question is what are the things that people need to be aware of whether they have been you know, in that space for five years, 10 years, or just embarking on it, what are the things that they need to know? Look, um, food and beverage is, um, can be a tricky one, an exciting one. I mean, it's, it's very competitive. Um, only yesterday I had a client that came to me that's got a product. I don't want to call out this client at this point, but it's got a, a, a unique product that has, you know, make some claims that are uh, kind of borderline, you know, medic kind of crossover into the medical space. Mm. Um, and so unless you really go through the process of kind of sense checking what you're going to do, you know, labeling, labeling issues, food labeling issues are a big deal. Um, but, you know, making claims about particular products you know, aiding in, 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 uh, insomnia, in, in relieving, you know, in mm. symptoms of X or Y or insomnia or, or, you know, ADHD or autism, or, you know, will, will be a cure for, you know, a particular ailment. Mm. Um, and then setting up a website and marketing material and, you know, and, and basically pumping out what is really a fantastic idea, um, without doing that kind of due diligence to see, you know, whether there's going to be a problem with the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Act, et cetera, and whether you mm. can make these types of statements. Um, sometimes it's, it's, you know, the saying is like, you know, let, let's just go for gold. You know, a lot of mm. startups are like, let's just, let's just open those gates and just rush mm. to be first to market and get out there and, and if and don't worry if we break it you know mm-hmm. we'll deal with it on along the way and look i don't discourage that you know there's a lot of you know successful startup businesses um you know and you don't have to be first to market mm-hmm. but a lot of them are first to market or or movers and shakers they get out there they break shit mm-hmm. and they worry about fixing it afterwards because you know i'm a lawyer you know professional legal professionals and you know any professional for that matter are, are, are so risk averse, you know, we're, we're crossing the T's, we're dotting the I's. And sometimes if you focus too much on crossing the T's and dotting the I's, you get left behind. Um, but that's, that's my job. So I have to kind of look at the risk. And if I was, if I was looking at food and beverage, for example, I'd be saying to these startups that have got these grand ideas, um, 
you know, just maybe seek the advice of a, of a professional um, in the beginning to understand whether you can do something or not and whether you're going to run into any issues or not mm -hmm. down the line because it's a lot easier to kind of work out what those potential problems are going to be in the, at the outset mm. and how to navigate around them than to just say, you know what, fuck it, uh, I'm just going to do it. And then when I get a letter from the TGA or I get a letter from the Law Society or I get a letter from, you know, some op, uh, um, um, some board, mm. um, you know, of a, of a particular industry saying that this has come to our attention that you're doing X, Y, Z, then, then you've got to get, you've got to act really quickly. You know, we, I received an email this week from a client that's received a, 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 an email from a, um, a, a health department basically saying it's come to our attention that your website, et cetera, doesn't comply with, you know, food health safety standards for these reasons. Well, actually, they didn't set out all the reasons, but, you know, and we would like a response by, you know, within the next week. And they've got to go through and deal with all these issues now, um, even though their business is booming. Um, which may require them to substantially change certain um, uh, statements and uh, marketing material that they've put out there to the public that they've uh, that, that that public's already come to know. So, um, so that's one of the things that you know with FMCG in particular um, is, is 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 prudent for that for that party to 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 get their head around. It's kind of like you don't know what you don't know, right? You try to find out all the things that I need to uh, be aware of and all the things I need to uh, stay away from and all that stuff. But there's so much uh, in the area of law that you have to know unless you're a practitioner. You're not going to be able to know all that stuff. And it's not about going online and reading a blog post or going on Reddit. And, you know, even if someone has put, like, has given you the right advice, that could have been two years ago. And a lot could have changed from, from then to now. Yep. Um, is, is, you touched on one week. Do you want to comment on that? I was going to say, I mean, another piece of work that came in this week was a, was a we're doing a, it's a, a really hefty agreement that's come from a very large law firm it was mm. was it hit my desk uh, it was 85 pages long and mm. you know i'm not a, a a lawyer from a big law firm but i've got enough experience behind me to tackle you know the top lawyers and the top law firms and to be honest with you i wasn't overly impressed with this agreement that hit mm. my desk um but and, and it was a it, it was covered so many different warehousing to logistics to supply to services to you know it was mm. a, it was a JV it's a it's a it's a big deal mm. um, what I was cap I mean what I do mm. is is I, I can take that agreement mm. uh, even though by the time you get to page 85 you know you're practically mm. asleep um, but what I can do is I can take clauses that to, to the layperson to, to people that are, are not used to doing or dealing with this they, they will read they'll read a paragraph they'll read that clause and it'll just be like yeah that seems fine to me whereas i'll look at it and go like fuck no like mm -hmm. these are the implications this mm -hmm. is what will happen like it's just words on a piece of paper at mm -hmm. the end of the day but they they mean something in in a practical sense and you've got to think about it practically and what it actually means um when you're in when you're actually putting it to the test mm. um, and what changing one or two words or changing, you know, this here or there will do will actually mean for the way the relationship is, is conducted or conveyed between the parties and the way business, the business operates and how successful that might be in the future or not. So it's, it's seriously important, you know, to, to consider these, these matters. Do you look long-term, do you uh, look at, the business might encounter or, you know, the growth uh, trajectory that they are on and how that will impact them in two years' time or three years' time and look for things to protect them, uh, w like, around and in uh, now 
or are you just taking from the business founder or, or you know, the owners or the CEOs or whoever you're working with, uh, what they need to work on now and, you know, the status quo? Or do you also look at beyond what they tell you and say, okay, look, I can see this, that that is something that can happen in two years' time or a year, um, and here's how you guys should go about it. Well, you see, I, uh, the way I work uh, within my firm is is um, I promote myself as your external in-house counsel, mm -hmm. you know, your advisor on tap to my clients. So, um, selling legal service, you know, providing a legal service and selling your time. You know, it's 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 very hard because again, coming back to what I was saying before, you know, providing legal advice is, is really not something that clients want mm -hmm. to pay money for. They it's, it's there's there's other things that they feel are more important. But at the end of the day, it's it's um, it, I I have to gauge where the client's at in their stage of business and what they want. Of course, I want to be able to, to show them and say to them, like, this is what could happen in two years' time. But, you know, I don't, I don't launch into every new client engagement or meeting with, you know, here's, the, here's your list of every single th legal thing that you require because it's fast moving. And not just in FMCG, I'm just generally, it's fast moving and, and, and things change day in, day out, why, which is why as, a, as an in-house lawyer, and having that experience, you know, having a, a, a legal advisor or somebody, I don't even like to call myself a lawyer. I like to be kind of an, ad, a, you know, a, an advisor to a business mm. uh, that just ha so happens to know about the law mm. and, and how to uh, apply the skills that I've learned over the years to the successful running of a business. So back to your question, um, it may be that I'm just, advising on particular projects at, at, at any given time mm. um, or it may be that I'm advising on you know what could be in the future you know and what we need to do right now of course every time I go into meeting with a client I I like to immerse myself in their business in mm. their culture and their lifestyle and their brand and and I don't see a client as a short term uh, as a as like a short-term project mm. um, like accountants and many other uh, businesses, subscription models, etc. You know, once you get that client, you know you can have that client for a long time. Mm -hmm. With a legal service, it's it's you know they'll come to a lawyer. You know, oh, we need an NDA, a non disclosure agreement. Um, you know, can you do it? And then you know maybe a couple of weeks later, oh, and we're now ready to get trademarks done. Can you do that? You know, and then you may not hear from them for six months and then they'll come back to you and say, oh, we've had this problem with our supplier. We need to recover some monies. Can you help us do that? You know, and okay. So for me, I like to try and position myself to be that lawyer that they don't feel, you know, you know, how do I put it? Trying to push you know, on them. Or you push on them or yeah. almost scared to contact because he's charging by the mm. hour and this is going to cost me, you know, in six minute increments every time I speak mm. on the phone. I, I give a lot of my time away for free um, because it's, for me, it's so important to establish relationships mm. because I want to be that advisor on tap. I want to be that person that they can trust, that they can get to know, which is why I've stripped down the whole suit and tie image, et cetera. I want them to feel like I'm part of their business um, and, I, and I can help them along the way um, so that I can help them with that growth. Because, you know, it may be that they're a startup now or a smaller business now, but in three years or five years time, you know, they could be going to IPO. Mm. I mean, you look at the growth of, of, of businesses like Afterpay and Zip, Etc. I mean, these businesses, you know, haven't been around for 30 years, like mm -hmm. Coca, some of the big Coca, uh, uh, FMCG brands, you know, especially in the tech space, they're moving and breaking things so quickly. Mm. Um, and, you know, so I like to get in early and then try to help these guys out, particularly when they uh, don't have a lot of experience, they don't have big teams, they don't have in-house support, um, and I can help guide them. Mm. And establishing that relationship and trust in the early stages in a way, pays off in the long term. Uh, like you said, when they grow and, you know, the business multiplies, they always remember that person. Mark was the person we went to and really helped us uh, have uh, the right structure and stay away from all the things that can potentially get us into trouble uh, from a legal commercial perspective, etc. So that's cool. 
Um, we touched on FMCG. Um, we kind of touched also on tech. Is there anything in, perhaps we can just uh, expand a little bit uh, in tech first and then maybe go to real estate. I don't know if you if you want to go there. Yeah, I mean, tech, real estate. I mean, one other other area I'm doing a lot of work in at the moment is, is health and beauty. Cool. Um, so um, I've got some very interesting clients that have got mm -hmm. some really unique concepts and ideas. Um, and one of them's built a, a really solid business in the um, in the um, basically in the co-working space in the beauty industry. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's super cool, mm -hmm. uh, really exciting project, and lots of really decent stuff happening, and and uh, yep. awesome awesome you know just to be part of that experience. Cool. Uh, do, do you want to touch on a few things that people need to be aware of if they are in the tech space? Um, look, I don't think the tech space is, I mean, that, that's very a, diverse, so diverse, mm. it really depends. But you know, the tech space, I mean, depends whether it's, you know, like a financial product, or whether it's, you know, it's just a, you know, a SaaS product, mm. or, you know, having, you know, having the right, again, it's knowing the scope and having the right mm. structure. And I don't just mean in terms of corporate structure, but having the right kind of mm. uh, structure for the business and understanding the product and how it works and the regula the regulatory issues around it um, is extremely important. You know, having the right kind of site and terms and conditions and, and uh, um, you know, from that perspective is important. But I mean, I don't, it's hard to answer mm. that question without really knowing, cool. you know, the kind of the specific, mm requirements of that business maybe next time we can dive into some examples is there so when you have two companies uh one taking the other uh, uh into a dispute or suing them for something um an example for example the um fortnite suing apple yeah not sure if you heard about that uh but fortnite is um uh epic games is the company yep and one of the products is fortnite and the I, whole I, I know it too well. You know it too well? <laughs> I okay, do. so for everyone all my, all my son knows it too well. Yeah. Um, but do you know also about the dispute? Yeah. Okay, cool. So for everyone listening, the short story is um, Apple, uh, well, Epic Games is saying, look, you guys, and you can elaborate on that, uh, but Apple is um, having a monopoly in the app um, world. It's almost a monopoly because you got, Google Play, probably that's just them, like maybe someone else. But if it's not a monopoly, it's an oligopoly, right? There's only two or three players. And they are asking for a very big, uh, according to Epic Games, a very big uh, commission percentage out of all the app installs or in-app purchases. And so they... Epic Games is saying, look, that's, that's, that's crazy, that's, you know. So back to the question, you have two companies are in dispute. Um, how much, and that's probably like a theoretical question too, how much of a business's success in a dispute is, you know, something that comes down to how competent the lawyer is versus... Um, the position that the business is actually in? Oh, there's so many factors there to consider because it, it, it really comes down to, to the, to the argument, to the case, mm. to, 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 to the, the, the law, mm. you know, to the interpretation, to whether there's been any previous law that supports mm. a particular argument it comes down to, who the player is on the other side and how much clout they have, mm. how much how much money they have, mm. because um, you know there, there are David and Goliath moments all the time. With you know, if you're looking at a at a big company against a, a much smaller company, they may have a much weaker case than that mm. smaller company, but they got much deeper pockets. Weaker case, deeper pockets. So mm. they will just um, basically incur so much in the way of legal cost um which would not be such an issue to them that mm. the 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 other party you know when I, when I say incur you know they will just drag out a proceeding for so long you 
know, with with interlocutory applications and you know, and 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 various, you know, almost like mini hearings within hearings. And it becomes that, exhausting. And that costly. it becomes exhausting emotionally mm. and financially for a player to the extent that um, that player has to throw in the towel or they'll mm. go bankrupt or their business will, you know, go into administration, etc. cetera. So, um, you know, these are tactics, mm. you know, all the time uh, that, that, that these, these two, you know, opposing sides will, will have. Mm. Um, so you've got, you've got that, you've got, and that, and that then leads into, you know, the, the, the lawyers on the other side, you know, mm. what kind of lawyers, you know, where are they from, what are their backgrounds, what are their credentials? Mm. You know, there's some barristers at the New South Wales Bar uh, who are the top of their game that are, pay, that, that, are, that are paid or charged, I should say, you know, $25,000, $30,000 a day for their time. So, you know, that, that's a lot of money. Maybe it's not a lot of money for a big company like Apple, but for a smaller company, um, and not that, mm. you know, Epic Games is smaller uh, by any means, but I'm just saying, you know, it's it's for a much smaller entity, you know, or a small startup, etc. You know, that's trying to make their 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 way in the world. Um, they wouldn't have a chance. Mm. And so, and then and then it also so coming again, it comes back down to the lawyers, etc. It comes down to the judge. Um, it, 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 there's so many other mm. factors at play here that uh, that it's hard to say. Uh, I've got a matter on at the moment. Or a client in the uh, it's a building construction industry security for payment act claim which i won't bore you with the details but basically um my my clients in a in an interesting predicament because you know the argument that both sides have has never really been tested in court you know there's no there's no real case law authority on these particular points that would be able to determine you know you know that one party is going to have a much stronger position than another party. So um, it's, and, and even if that's the case, you know, litigation going to court, mm. you know, is, is a, is a gamble because, th because of all these factors that I told you about, and there's so many more mm. um, it's, there's, there's no way any lawyer or barrister will, look, any lawyer or barrister will give you an advice on prospects. So what are your prospects of succeeding? But no one is going to put a hat on hard and say, you are going to hundred percent win this this case, and and so that becomes challenging mm. because you know a lot of emotion gets in the way here, and sometimes you just you have to fight your case. Mm. Other times it's like, is it really worth it? Cool. All right. Well, this is uh, this has been good, action packed. You've done uh, most of the talking today, so I'm super glad <laughs> you got to get I, I uh, always some, do. some some of your energy out uh, is there anything that you want to share before we wrap up um look i i love coming here so thanks for inviting me i think Sorry. you know I, I, every week in my practice and what i'd like to if, if i start to feature more with you every week i come across really interesting matters without mm. disclosing details of clients um I come across interesting matters that have like everything that we do day to day has a legal component to it. Mm. You know, like fuck law is so boring, but it's just part of our lives. Mm. Everything we do has a legal component and has a legal consequence. I got into a, 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 a an Uber the other day, uh, going to a, a client in, in, in the CBD. Um, and, he asked us if we didn't mind if he didn't mind recording uh, our conversation in the back of the Uber. Um, and shout out to Aussie Uber, um, who is creating a podcast uh, that allows, you know, subject to to obtaining consent, he will record real life conversations uh, that his passengers have in the back of the Uber, mm. um, which is brilliant. But there are legal ramifications uh, behind it. There's this, the in New South Wales, it's the Surveillance Devices Act 2007 about what constitutes, you know, uh, um, uh, um, consent, consent, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 whether you can have it recorded or not. And I, again, I'm not going to go into the intricacies, but I found that really interesting. We, still, we I'm actually going to put an article out there on it. Um, 
because every state and territory has different legislation on on this as well and when when you can be recorded with or without consent mm. um so just bear that in mind you know whatever business you're in whatever you're mm. doing um there's always legal matters that are going to come up on a day-to-day -day basis and that's why you know, I love doing what I do and I love positioning myself the way I position myself um, within my firm. Uh, and that's, and, and why I focus on what I focus on because it is all about immersing yourself in the culture, lifestyle and ethos of your clients and the brands. And, uh, mm. and that's, that, that is where I really get the high. Well, I got a, I got a high listening to, to this today. Uh, Definitely learn a few things. So thanks. And, and next uh, time I'm going to bring some of my client. Ooh, next time I'm going to bring some of my client product to uh, to the show, uh, so we can crack some open at the end. Cool. Sounds very good. Uh, all right, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hello.